And also, Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 33 or so. Now, I'm not sure if the Orthodox Study Bible, which goes off of the Septuagint, is the same as the RSV in terms of the verse, versification of Jeremiah 31. Um, <clears throat> but anyway... So in, Jer in Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1, we have this bold and strong proclamation or, or assertion of St. Paul. You were dead, he says. You were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. You were dead in them. Now, <clears throat> how, um, so if you're dead in the theology of the church, where are you dead? <laughs> where are you dead? You know, what's the locus? What's the place? What's the central point of where you are dead? Uh, who said heart? The soul, but the heart in the soul. So the heart is where you are dead. Now if, so the heart is the root. The heart is also, and I don't have time to demonstrate this. The heart is also the gate to heaven. It's the temple. I mean, it's, it's the, it is the real temple of which the, te the, 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 the temple of stone or the temple of skins is but the icon. It's the image. It's the external. It's the, it's, it's the outward, the visible representation of the invisible temple of the heart. Here I'm following the, the uh, Syriac Christian uh, doc, uh, tradition. Um, <clears throat> so the heart is the gate to heaven. From the heart, and as the root of everything, that everything proceeds from the heart. So, again, I'm not going to take the time to demonstrate this, but I believe it's fair to say that here, somehow, in some way, the will proceeds. Here is the locus of the choice, that the choices that we make, the will that, you know, our will. Here's where we choose, deep down in here, where we're going to go, in which direction we're going to go. And throughout the uh, ancient literature of the, of the, uh, of the scriptures and also of, of early Jewish Christianity, um, you see it everywhere. There the, the, this deep mystery of what's going on within us is portrayed 
in the metaphor of a path. There are two paths. One path goes to destruction, the other path goes to life. And this is not a bibli- an, uh, an exclusively biblical metaphor either. It is also in the philosophers. The one is the path that leads to forgetfulness, the other is the path that leads to uh, heaven. So if you are dead in your sins and trespasses, you are dead in your heart. Now just think about it. If you're dead in your heart, how is that going to affect you, your life? I know that's a wide open question, but just think about it. How is that going to affect you? Are you going to be able to get to heaven? No. The gate's closed. It's dead. It's dark. Um, are you going to be able to um, be righteous? The wisdom of Solomon. Righteousness is immortal. You know, it's eternal life. Are you going to be able to do anything that's truly living? Uh, Yes, exactly. You're not. That's that's what I want you to see. Because now you begin to understand or begin to understand or see the strength, the force of St. Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. We've already shown how this word for transgressions, the Greek word is to lie alongside of a corpse. Para, ptoma. Ptoma is a corpse. Para is alongside. Sin is to, is, is to veer away from the mark. The mark, of course, would be God and, and righteousness in life. So, you were dead because you know, it, it brings to mind the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, the man goes down to Jericho That's his sin. Because he's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. What's in Jerusalem? The temple. He's going away from the temple to Jericho. What's in Jericho? What's that? Exactly. Because it's in the plains of Jericho that the Israelites played the harlot and and gave themselves to the idols of their neighbors. So, um, you were dead in your sins and trespasses. You're like the... No, it's not the prodigal. Yeah. No, it, it's the Good Samaritan. I'm, th- I'm sorry. It's the Good Samaritan, the man who goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. We play the man who goes down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's a, beset by thieves, and he's left on the road for being, for, uh, as half dead. So, he's lying... He's lying in laws. He's basically he's almost a corpse. So, he's, part, he, you know, he's lying in his transgressions. He's next to being, he's almost to be a corpse. All right, so now you begin to understand what St. Paul is saying in, the, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. In these, in what? What's the, pre, the, uh, the, uh, the antecedent to, to these? Yes, in your trespasses and sins. What did you do? You walked around. You walked around. Um... <coughs> Um, And, you know, uh, you walked around in accordance with or aligned with, you know, so that your boundaries were, as it were, you walked around according to what? The age of this world. You followed the path that was aligned with the ruler of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So I th- this is the point that we've made before, that this dark spirit, this evil spirit, has an energy. And there is an energy in death, is there not? And there's something working in a corpse. There's an energy that's working in a corpse. What is that energy working? I and mean, what's, what's going on in a corpse? Corruption. It's disintegrating. So you were 
you were walking around in this in this energy. This was the energy that 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 filled you, you know, that was working in you. The energy of disintegration and corruption. Then it goes on to say, um, and um, in in these also, we all um, conducting ourselves, you know, before in in the desires of our flesh, doing, and this plural here, doing the wills of the flesh, doing all the things that the flesh wanted to do. But I think it's also very interesting. And of the thoughts. What does it say in your Bibles? The mind? mind. mind. The word is, is plural. It's not the mind. The mind is a different word. And you could translate it as mind, but you know, it's only if you're being very, very generous in, in, in the parameters that you're using for your, diff, for your words. But it seems to me that when we're talking spirituality, we need to be very precise. And this word is, I've, I've shown it to you before, it's plural, and it's made up of the word for mind, and this preposition, which means through. So the word dianoia sets forth this picture, draws a picture of these these things, these these these, the intelli these intellectual thoughts, running through the mind. Hmm. It's a beautiful imagery of the thought. That's what a thought does. It goes, it runs through your mind. So you're do it says you are doing the will, the plural, the wills of the flesh, and of your thoughts. And we were children by nature of wrath, of anger as also were the rest. I like this word back up to verse 3, in which also all of us were conducting ourselves. Because that word needs to turn around. So the picture that's drawn is that we were, um, we're turning around this way, turning around that way, going up, whichever way you turned, you were still lying in your sins and trespasses. You were still, you, and whichever way you, were, you turned, what was working in you was this disintegrating, corrupting energy of death, of the ruler of this age, of the prince of the power of the air. And its energy is the energy of disobedience. In other words, it's, it's, it's impelling us away from the mark, which is Christ. It's impelling us away from life and into the tomb. Therefore, <clears throat> You notice that your flesh, you know, your body and your mind, they're still going. They're still going. Obviously, we're not talking about physical death, are we? You were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah, and you were walking in them. So you're still going. So if you're dead in your sin, if, if you're dead in your heart, if the root is corrupt, you understand? The, the, the heart is the root of the mind. It's the root of the body. It's the root of the soul. So if the heart is corrupt, what chance do you possibly have in your thoughts, your soul, your mind, your soul, your body, what chance do you possibly have of exuding the fragrance of, of life, you know, fresh air? I mean, you, you get the picture. You get the picture. Okay. Okay. Now, for this, I want to go back to Jeremiah 31. Now that you have the picture. Jeremiah. <clears throat> Is Father Thaddeus here this morning? We might, he might be calling on him more than he was looking for. Okay, chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. By the way, how, does a, how do you seal a covenant? With the blood. With the blood, which, you know, I mean, 
the image of the blood, of course, evokes also the image of the heart. So the heart's got to be involved somehow in, in the sealing of the covenant. I mean, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the picture somehow. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Okay, what was the blood by which he sealed that covenant? The blood of bulls and goats. And uh, the epistle to the Hebrews makes mention of that. Um, you know, so listen. And this is, I mean, this is the imagery that I think that the epistle to the Hebrews, St. Paul in his epistle to the Hebrews is drawing from. If, if the heart of man is corrupt, and if the heart of man is the temple, the gate of heaven, through which all of creation uh, is, is offered to God in heaven, or is, is, is brought into the heavens, well, if the heart is corrupt, if man, if man's heart is corrupt, can you see, the whole earth is corrupt. Everything is corrupt. Therefore, what is the, how is the blood of bulls and goats going to do you any good? And that's why, according to the epistle to the Hebrews, they had to sacrifice these bulls and goats constantly. Constantly. In order to cleanse us. And even then, precisely because it was the bull of bloods and goat, the blood of bulls and goats, it was not strong enough. It was not pure enough. It was not holy enough to cleanse us. The word that St. Uh, Paul uses in Hebrews was not strong enough to cleanse us all the way down to our conscience. All the way down to our conscience, which would be the organ, you know, deep in the heart, um, where we can tell, where we can feel, we know <laughs> whether we're doing good or not. So it could not cleanse it. Okay, so it goes on. Um, <clears throat> not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. Notice the nuptial imagery of the covenant. And what do we call Christ? The nuptial imagery, our bridegroom. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be, no, they shall be my people. Now, this is one of several passages in the prophets that talk about this new covenant. I think it's in Ezekiel. It might also be in Jeremiah in a few places. Where God talks about putting into them, putting into us a new heart. Replacing the heart of stone with a new living heart. Um, but let's just focus on this for a minute. I will put my law within them. Do you know what the law is? Or should I say, do you know who the law is? I just gave it away. Exactly. Um, and me, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an expert on these matters. So, but just based on on what I've read and what I've, uh, what I've, uh, what I've read, um, I'm thinking that in the beginning of Genesis, when it says, "In the beginning was the word," of the God, and God said, "Let there be light." You know that the light is is created there. It's created. But the light that would be brought into being would be the Torah, the law. Um, and so it would be in the light of Torah, the light of the law, that all of creation comes into being. But as the light, the created light, and you notice it's not even the sun and the moon yet. The sun and the moon have not yet been created. Um, as the light, as this created light, it would be the icon of the uncreated light, who, of course, is Christ. The light shining in the darkness. The true light as coming into the world, John 3.19. The true light that is coming into the world. So, when he says, I will put my law um, within them. Who is he, what, can you see that this is a prophecy of the Incarnation? He's saying, I'm going to come in the flesh. I, the uncreated light, am going to come. And I'm going to be inside of you. And then he goes on to say, I will write it upon their hearts. I will write it upon their hearts. I don't know what the original for that is. I didn't take the trouble to look it up. But write it upon their hearts. I may be, you know, this may be crazy. 
Um, but uh, it, 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 to me, this is icon language. This is icon language. So when he says, I will write it upon their hearts, he's saying, I'm going to put an icon in their hearts. Well, who's the icon of the invisible God? Yes, it's Christ. So, it's a prophecy of God himself coming to be within us. Okay, but, where is the point? Where's the locus point where he's going to be found or centered? The heart. The heart. The heart. So, the significance, the mystery of the virgin Theotokos. How is it, why is it that God chose her? Was it because she was just a maiden happening to pass by? And he said, oh, I'll choose you. Why did he choose her? Was it, it was her purity of heart. It was her purity of heart. And so, he was received by her. In a way that we cannot understand, and we do not presume to explain it. But he was received by her because of her purity of heart. And he took up his abode in her, as in his living temple. He took up his abode in her, in her heart. In the sanctuary of the temple, her heart. So, in the Virgin Theotokos... God the Word, God the Light, God the Law Himself takes up His dwelling in the pit of our heart where we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Okay, hang on. Where did you go? I wanted to share with you Something from Archimandrite Sophroni. Archimandrite Sophroni is the one who wrote the biography of St. Siloan of the Holy Mountain. And in his book, The, Wis the Monk of Mount Athos, on page 22, and this is what he writes. The light of the divine word the light of the divine word brings sin into view. I think that's the experience of many of us. Um, how many, I mean, so many, several, more than one. They come to me close to the time of their entrance into the church and they struggle with confession. And their confession is rather vague and uh, imprecise, and <laughs> I just can't remember. Okay? Fast forward, one or two months down the road. Now they come to confession, and they, <laughs> they, 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 their confession is quite, quite detailed. How so? What happened? It was in the light of the divine word that they began to see all the darkness inside of them. What does the Christian understand by sin? Sin is primarily a metaphysical phenomenon, a metaphysical phenomenon, that means it's beyond nature, whose roots lie deep in the mystic depths of man's spiritual nature. This is the heart. The essence of sin consists not in the infringement of ethical standards, but in a falling away from the divine eternal life for which man was made, and to which, by his very nature, he is called. Sin is committed, first of all, in the secret depths of the human spirit. Spirit is a synonym for heart in spiritual literature. But its consequences distort the whole individual. A sin will reflect on a man's psychological and physical condition, on his outward appearance, on his personal destiny. Sin will inevitably pass beyond the boundaries of the sinner's own life to burden all humanity and thus affect the fate of the whole world. 
Every sin, secret or manifest, committed by each one of us, has a bearing on the rest of the universe. Why? Because sin has its root here in the heart. And here in the heart is where we open not just unto heaven, but unto all the world. So if the heart is closed, if it's dead, not only are we closed off to heaven, we're closed off to everything else. And we are all by ourselves in this cage, this prison of darkness in which death is working its energy of disintegration and corruption. We're slowly disintegrating. And goodness sakes, you can see that even now. Goodness sakes, I mean, you know, the burgeoning industry of psychological counseling and therapy. My goodness. Um, you know, it's, um, the evidence is all around. You don't have, this is not a religious assertion. This is simply a statement of spiritual fact. Now, <clears throat> having drawn this, I hope picture, I hope morbid picture in which you're feeling a little bit, at least a little bit, I hope, um, depressed, despairing. I hope you're feeling a little despairing. Where, you know, there's no hope. I'm dead, no matter which way I turn. I'm in darkness, I'm in death. So then, let us turn now. Well, we can turn now to chapter 2. Start up with verse 5 here. Ephesians? Uh, yes, Ephesians. <coughs> um, well, let's start with verse 4. But now God, who is so rich in mercy, through the abundant of the great, uh, through his great love, with which he loved us, we, even when we were dead in our sin, in our, in our, in our trespasses, our paraptomas, even when we were lying by the side of the road, almost a corpse, half dead, in our sins and trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. And he raised us up Okay, you hearing the parable of the Good Samaritan? He raised us up and he set us together with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If he made us alive, okay, where precisely did he make us alive? In the heart. In the heart. Because that's, remember, that's where he descended. All the way into the heart. And I think that Theophany is setting forth that mystery. The waters of the Jordan are the waters of creation. And you remember that the heavens opened. Well, you've got, I'm thinking this takes us back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, or whatever it is, when God separates the firmament, the waters below from the waters above. So this mystery of Christ's baptism in the Jordan is the picture of that moment in creation when the above is being divided and distinguished from the below. And into the middle, you see Christ. God the Word, God the Word, in the middle. He's, he's opening the heavens, or he's, you know, he's separating First, he's splitting the waters, so he's splitting, he's dividing the waters, which is an image, a picture of the of the of the of the deliverance of uh, the Israelites in the Red Sea from the army of Pharaoh. But it's also an image; it brings back the image of Elijah when he crosses over the Jordan with his disciple Elisha, smacks the Jordan with his mantle, the Jordan parts. He goes into beyond the Jordan, into the wilderness, and that's where he's ascended into heaven. So, um, 
But, it, but, the, but to me, the, the focal point here is, is the moment of creation, Genesis chapter 1, whatever it is, the, the God dividing the waters from above to, from the waters below, and Christ in the middle. It's like the middle point is the heart. And here's where the above opens onto the below, where the below up opens onto the above. So Christ is there in the middle. He's in the heart. And the heavens opened. Okay. If the heavens are opening, well, I mean, where are they opening? You know, it, it, you know mystically, in the, most, in the deepest, most ultimate sense, where are they opening? They're opening in the heart. Because the heart is the gate. The heart is that point where everything, op where the whole world opens onto, onto heaven. So in the virgin Theotokos, in her heart, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit of man, the human spirit, this is why it's so important, the doctrine that Christ doesn't have just one, you know, one mind, or excuse me, one will and one energy, but he has two, both a human and a divine. That's why it's so important. The human energy, the human heart, he opens onto the heavens. And now that's where he's going towards the heavens. Um, so um, this is where Christ has made us alive in the hearts. So if Christ has made us alive in the pit of the heart, how's that going to affect us? You know, how's that going to affect us? If, if death affected us in our hearts so that we couldn't do anything. Well, now Christ has been buried in our heart. You know, he's, 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 he's descended into the waters of the Jordan. And according to the Syriac tradition, again, he left his robe of light there at the bottom of the Jordan. And also, according to the liturgical texts, at the bottom of the Jordan, he reveals this path. Well, he himself is the path. He reveals this path, which is called in the liturgical text, the liturgical hymns, the better and changeless path that ascends to heaven. We call it, we say in another place, that he has blazed the trail into the heavens. We say in another place that through the mysteries of Christmas and the mysteries of Theophany, the flaming sword that guarded the tree of life draws uh, apart, you know, parts. It, it, it draws, us, draws away. And now if we want to, we can enter, if we want to, and, and partake of the tree of life and become once again gardeners of immortal plants. Now, but before I run out of time before my alarm goes off here. I'm going to take you to chapter 3 of Ephesians, starting with verse 14. And therefore, <clears throat> or, or because of this, all of these wonderful things in which Christ has made us alive, um, and then somewhere up here, he says, he now says that, is it up here? Um, he says that Christ is working in us. I should have marked exactly where that is. So I don't have to. But let's see here. So that now, just as death was working in us before, now Christ himself is working in us. So therefore, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father, from whom is every fatherhood in heaven and on earth named. And I pray <clears throat> that he will grant to you according to the wealth of his glory, in power, that you would become strong through his spirit in the inner man. The inner man is, where's, what's the inner man? It's the heart. <laughs> to that, that uh, Christ uh, will dwell, that, that, to, that you will dwell, that Christ will dwell in you through the faith that is in your hearts so that you are rooted in love and are founded in love. Um, in order that you might come to understand uh, and to trace out, you know, this takes us back to Jeremiah 31, I will write my law in their hearts. I'm going to etch it out that you will you'll be able to etch out and trace out or write out um, with all of the saints, what is the breadth, the breadth, the breadth, the depth, the height, and the length of, you know, and the, of Christ's love? To know the surpassing 
goodness of, and of the knowledge of the love of Christ, in order that you might be filled with all the workings of all the fullness of God. Um, work, we'll go real quick to... Um, hang on, is it, is it here? Um, Um, chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 19 and 20. Chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Um, and, and, and what is, the, so, so that you might come to see, you know, who is the hope of your, of your calling, who is the, the wealth of the glory of your inheritance among the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of Christ's power. Um, that is in you um, who believe according to the energy of the strength of his power. But you might come to know the surpassing greatness of his power, which is in you who believe according to the energy. I mean, look at all these four different words to denote strength. So, where is this power of Christ working? What's the locus point? Where's the locus point? Heart. The heart. And what precisely is this power that is being worked in us in, from our heart? The power by which he destroys death. By his death. And raised us up with him and set us in the heavens with him and made us alive. Do you see what the picture is? In our heart, where we were dead in our sins and trespasses, Christ has buried himself. This is the, this is the mystical meaning. And by mystical, I do not in, in any way mean to say that it was not historical. It was historical, but the history opens unto the spiritual, the mystical. It's the mystical meaning, the significance of Christ's burial in the tomb. This is the mystical meaning of his being um, baptized in the Jordan. The mystical meaning of his birth in, in, in Bethlehem. He is planting himself at the pit, at the root, at the core you know, at the bottom of the bottom of our being in our heart. So, when we are baptized, we are brought into this mystery. We are united with Christ in the likeness of his death and resurrection. We come into his church, which is not a body of beliefs. It's the body of Christ. <laughs> It's the body of the person of Christ who has conquered death. So it's the body of life. You know, don't come into the church to believe this or this or that, you know. To be in the church means to live according to this or that. It means to live according to the, the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Christ. So this is in us. This is St. Paul's point. It's in us. He says it so many places. Christ in you. The mystery of God. Christ in you. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, says the Lord Jesus, is within you. It's not out there. So, the source of our salvation and the source of the healing of our will is here. So, um, it's, it, it, so now it leads to the next thing that I would want to do, and that is, okay, <clears throat> how then do I how then do I submit myself to this mystery that is within me so that my will can begin to be healed? The picture I wanted you to see is that in this, in this image, you know, where the heart is, dar is dead, dark, and corrupt, the will that proceeds from it will also be dead, dark, and corrupt, and perverted. But now Christ has, has planted himself in there. And so from the new heart that has been planted in the human nature, through the mystery of Christ's incarnation, a new human will is also proceeding 
from the heart. A new human will, which is the will of obedience, the will of Christ. That's what's in me. Now, my will may still be, not maybe, my will still is all that it is, you know, um, recalcitrant, rebellious, um, you know, stubborn. Uh, but there's another will in me now. There's another will in me by virtue of my baptism and having received the sacraments of Christ. It's the will of Christ's humanity. So now you see the work of the church becomes how it becomes an ascetical work. How to submit my broken, darkened, dead will to the new will that has now been planted in me so that the new man in me can grow and the old man in me can begin to die. With this, at this point, I was going to take us, and so I will do this next Next week, we're going to go to St. Isaac of Nineveh. And we got what? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11. So I need to make a few more copies. I was going to give each one of you a copy. If you can remember, bring a pencil or a pen. And if you, I, I'll bring pens with me just in case you forget. And we'll have a, we're going to look at a couple of texts from St. Isaac of Nineveh, I think. That's my plan right now. And we'll um, study these texts in the light of this whole picture. And, as Saint, and see how St. Saint, Saint Isaac of Nineveh is teaching us, um, one of many voices teaching us in the church, on how you know, we make this pilgrimage from out here in the city of Egypt to in here, to the tomb of our heart, so that we can begin to practice and to live, not just to believe, but to live, you know, to live according to the Christ who is in us. All right. <laughs> this is going to be fun. This may be providential that Father Thaddeus came today. All right. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. All right. Well, God bless you.